would like to show you the complete step-by-step -step process of working on a watercolor painting. I have a new watercolor pad from Kilimanjaro. These are sheets of cold pressed watercolor paper and they're glued on four sides. And when you open the new pad, it has a protective covering, which I'm going to cut off. I printed my reference photo to the size, approximately the size of my watercolor paper, and I rubbed some charcoal on the back side of it. Now I'm going to use my pencil to transfer the drawing on the watercolor paper by tracing the photo. I wanted to trace this photo. Sometimes I just draw things, but this is a pretty complex subject. So I wanted to get all the proportions and all the angles right. So not to be distracted by incorrect drawing and also not to have too many pencil lines, trying to figure out what needs to be where. So I'm just going to transfer the general outline of all the objects. And that will be the basis of my painting. I'm going to draw this again with um, watercolor pencils. I'm going to draw the details first of all, and then charcoal, you know, it's hard to keep in place. It will just rub off if I start painting over it. I regret to say this dog is not mine. It's my friend's dog. His name is Fry and um, it's the porch of her country house and I just love that photo. I love the dog with his blue eye stare and I love the really bright light and that she captured in the photo. So I will try to convey that with my watercolors and keep that luminosity and that light in the painting. And the subject looks pretty complicated, but I think I can actually paint it fairly quickly if I keep things simple, if I don't get bogged down by too many details. So like I said, I'm using Dervent Inktense pencils to draw my subject. I like them because they will blend with watercolor and not stand out as much as a regular pencil. And I also use different colored pencils just to give even my sketch, my initial drawing, some variety. And I'm using a ruler to help me because there are so many straight lines. So next thing I'm going to do is just go over my painting with some clean water and a brush to create a tonal on the painting. I'm creating it by using pigment on the page and it helps me first of all to analyze the shadows in the painting. It helps me to see all the values in my reference photo and kind of study the photo a little better and also gives me a better idea where I need to put darker colors and where I need to preserve white paper because you know when you start painting with watercolor we have to work fairly quickly and it can be a little confusing if you have to start to think about values at the same time and the colors and the drawing. So I think doing this first step with um, watercolor pencils is really helpful and doesn't take that much time. If in some places I need to add a few details and if uh, all the pigment got washed away, can always add a little more. So while my paper is still wet from, uh, it's not wet, it's uh, damp from this uh, initial wash. So it's time to start doing first layer of watercolor. And my first layer of watercolor, I like to call it the layer of light. Now I'm going to paint the warm glow from the candles and from the windows surrounded by cool shadows. And I will take care to preserve the areas of those lanterns and that vase that's on the table and the teapot to preserve some white there and also to preserve some white on the dog. As you know, we don't have white pigment in watercolor, even though I will use some white gouache to bring back a few highlights. It's very important to keep white paper in some areas of our watercolor. It's very hard to get the same luminosity of white paper with anything else except by leaving it unpainted. So there is no precision in this first layer. I'm basically just letting colors run and uh, mix together and I'm working fairly lightly. I am applying pigment directly out of my wells, but my brush, first of all, I'm using a round brush it's uh, pretty saturated with water and I want this first layer to be transparent. You don't want to go super heavy and intense on the first go. Subsequent layers will be a lot more pigment and a lot less water and they will be a lot darker. But for illusion of light, I need paper to show through the paint. 
and you see even this first layer already gives you a pretty good idea of the um, finished painting I got my colors distributed and I already have pretty good idea of my values of my tonal relationships in the painting I'm going to let this first layer dry now that it's dry I had a few blossoms but it's okay because I am going to apply the second layer and the best way to correct blossoms is to use pigment on top of them and that will smooth them out without creating new blossoms or without damaging paper the second layer is fairly light as well I'm basically repeating the same colors I applied already but with a little more intensity I still want things to be fairly transparent and luminous and if something runs over where it's not supposed to be or you get super sharp edges you can use a stiff scrubber brush and soften them out like you see I'm doing in my painting I think it's also very very important to use transparent colors in this painting or in any painting where you're painting dark to keep that dark breathing and to keep the illusion of space I think the best approach is to use transparent colors in just very intense form because a lot of dark pigments they're mineral based and they are not transparent they're semi-transparent or even semi-opaque they settle on the surface of the paper and you lose that transparency of watercolor that we are looking for so I'm deepening all my values around the dog and also around that illuminated window and this is my second layer and now my third layer will be painting my darks I switch to a flat brush it gives me a lot more control I have a lot of straight lines that need to be straight <laughs> and it's a lot easier to do if you're using a flat brush I think so that's what I'm going to do and also at this point I started mixing my colors uh, I mixed indigo with phthalo blue and it gives me really intense deep blue you see how dark I'm painting but that's what you have to do because watercolor will lighten at least two shades when it's dry and um, applying many many layers is one way to go but you're risking making your colors muddy I think much better approach to have a very saturated mixture and just apply it all at once and then you can you know make corrections or edit even more pigment if you need to using a small round brush to work on the lanterns again have to be pretty precise with all those straight vertical lines so this is a little Chinese brush goat hair brush and I'm also trying to vary my darks as well you see I'm adding a bit of green to my mixture so some of my darks are more blue some of them are more green to some of them I will add some mineral violet so I think if you keep them varied it really contributes to visual interest of your painting not keeping all the darks uh, the same and as I start framing that window with darks you can see that um, it's almost like somebody turned the light behind your painting that range of tone that's what creates the illusion of light in the painting even if you leave white paper if your darks are not dark enough you will not have that effect of light burning brightly in the scene that plant is a little complicated to paint but I'm trying to treat it as any geometric object so I'm leaving some light areas and I'm painting shadows with blue green mixture and I might use some gouache later to just add a few little details to it but for the most part I try to avoid too many details and just paint it in as a general geometric form 
And there is also a plant inside. My friend who took this picture, she's a landscape architect and she loves plants and she has them everywhere. Uh, and again, we need to look at those as a big shape and not try to paint every single leaf, but just create an illusion of a geometric form behind glass. So as you see, even though it's a complicated subject, the painting goes fairly quickly. The most important thing is to keep looking at a grayscale version of your reference photo. You don't see it on the screen, but it's on my desk and I am constantly referring to it to remind myself about all those tonal relationships in my painting, not to see color, but to see tone. It's really helpful to have a black and white photo in front of you as well as the color one. This area, dark area on the bottom, is a little difficult because it's pretty large and um, I think the way to treat it is to mix several colors like I'm doing now. I'm throwing in blues and greens and purples in there because like I said before, I don't want it to look like a giant black hole. I want to have some interest and variety in there. And to a certain extent, I want to let the colors to run into each other and mix in there. It creates really nice, interesting effects. The dog is white with some gray markings, but if you squint when looking at the reference photo and if you look at the black and white photo, you will see that it has some very dark areas kind of between the paws and um, on the belly there. So I'm using the same intensity of paint as I used on the window frame for the dog. Paint his cute face here, the, his black nose. on the dog as well I use though there are some blues and I can see some purples on the forehead there and on the back of the dog. I put the list of colors that I used in the video description below. It's not that many. Using a set of colors all over the painting really unifies it and keeps the viewer's eye moving around your painting. All right, I think the watercolor portion is done. I might do a few adjustments to edges and some details. For now, I'm switching to white gouache to add the highlights, which I lost when I was painting with watercolor. They're very hard to preserve, especially working on a complicated scene like this. So I have some white artist gouache and I changed my water because I don't want any inclusions of pigment dragging from my dirty water. So I have clean water. And I'm adding some details with a number four liner brush. Using that tiny little brush is really good for details like fur on the animals. And I'm mixing in a bit of tallow blue so that not all my highlights are the same bright white. You see I'm doing that right now varying between white and um, blue. And if you want to learn more about painting animals with watercolor, I have a whole playlist where I show this technique in more detail using watercolor in combination with gouache to paint animals. So I hope you check it out. The teapot has tiny little forms, so it's much easier to bring them back with a small brush than trying to paint around them when I was working on larger forms few corrections on those lanterns, but I got that painted pretty well from the beginning. And I need to work on the edge of the table as well. I over darkened it. It's not so much problem of value. It's a problem of um, geometry. You know, when you paint geometric objects, that's pretty hard. So I use gouache to correct my drawing basically of the table. I had a problem with perspective there, but easy to fix with my opaque color. Also the couch I think needs some adjustments. So the paint ran over the back of it, but very easy to fix it. Let's also add some highlights to the plant. It's further away from the light. So the light is very wide, but the plant uh, is not going to be quite as white. So I mixed in a little bit of orange into white just to kind of dampen it a little bit. And I added highlights on the plant with that. 
this last stage requires, I call it fiddling. So you want to make corrections and get things looking right and being in the right places. But it's also the stage when you risk overworking things. So you have to stop from time to time and just ask yourself a question. Maybe I should leave things alone and leave some things to viewers' imagination instead of aiming for photorealistic effect and ending up overworking my painting and um, ruining my work. So it's a fine balance between showing the details and overworking something. I ruined many painting just because I couldn't stop fiddling with it. And let me know in comments if that happened to you as well. If uh, you're perfectionist and keep working on things until you hope they will look right and then they end up not looking right at all. I know I drag myself away from a painting many times just to rest my eyes and get a fresh perspective on what I've already done. The couch ended up having a sharp edge between the shadow side and the lit side, so I'm going to soften that. And also there is some light that's reflected from the floor, so the underside of the couch will have tiny little highlights, a bit of reflected light to separate that separates it from the darkness under the table and under the couch. I'm going to add a little more pigment there too. Watercolor keeps lightening as it dries but we can always add another layer if we're using transparent co colors like I'm doing. I'm using Ftalo Blue, which is very transparent, and I'm neutralizing it with uh, Scarlet Lake. That's my favorite combination. I've been using it a lot lately for darks. It creates a nice purplish transparent dark. And we're done. Here is a summer night scene with tea on the porch and a beautiful husky dog painted with watercolor and a little bit of white gouache. I hope seeing this whole process, working on the painting from the very start to finish, will help you in your watercolor endeavors and I hope to see you in the next video here on Tabirap Studios channel. Mm -hmm.